When it comes to health and wellness, good sleep is essential. Ashley invites you to a new era of sleep with the latest in sleep technologies. Experience all-night cooling with the Tempur-Pedic Breeze Collection or rest easy with adaptive pressure relief on the all-new Purple Collection thanks to its Gel Flex Grid. Don't lose sleep over choosing a new mattress. Your perfect fit is here at Ashley. Shop online or visit an Ashley store today. Better sleep starts here. Maybe this is a little childish of me, Captain, but one of my one of the parts that I thought was the most interesting out of all of the information that was released in these 283 pages throughout these different documents was the way that everything went down. Right. I've always fascinated by police procedure and the actual investigation more so than any of the gory details of the of the crime itself. Right. And I love the way that, that they carry things out. I love having an understanding of how they have to react at a moment's notice. So think about this. This case is, it, it's just kind of, for five and a half years, peaks and valleys, highs and lows, a roller coaster ride for everybody, not just the investigators, but especially the investigators. And then you had, you have all these, these times in the case where there doesn't seem to be anything really going on. And that's almost six years long, five and a half years long. Right. And then in October of 2022, Richard Allen is taken into custody. And the way that this comes about is because of an interview with him and his wife on October 13th. Well, what's really interesting to me is when you look at some of these documents, we know that they spoke with him on the 13th. Well, what also happened on the 13th? They filed the affidavit for a search warrant. They're requesting a search warrant, permission from a judge to search his property. Right. So the way that this all goes down is they... I, you can, you can picture this, but I'm going to draw the picture for you. They bring him and his wife in for questioning. Now, I want to be completely clear about this because one thing that is not clear in this case is everybody goes, well, he talked to the police and detectives when this all went down way back when, and they were never interested in him. Well, we need to figure out exactly the details of that, of what his conversations were with law enforcement in 2017. Because as it's stated, he spoke with a, a conservation officer. Right. Basically a park ranger. I'm guessing. Yeah. Like here we have, uh, we refer to them. You'll see the, the vehicles, they'll say natural resource officer. There's, there's several different titles and different ranks that you can hold in that, uh, in that agency. It is a form of law enforcement. Absolutely. No doubt about that. And I'm assuming their conservation officer is similar to what we're talking about here. Natural resources officer, park ranger. I think it, for me, it falls more into that category than actual homicide detective. And so we don't know, did this conversation take place at a supermarket somewhere? Did he go to a park ranger's office and tell them, hey, I was out there on the trails that day and they made note of it and it slipped through the cracks? Yeah. Did it happen at his work? What nobody is saying is that he came in, he marched into the sheriff's office and sat down with detectives. That's not what anybody's saying. So 
I would love to hear more details about Richard Allen's conversation with law enforcement back in 2017. But what we do know that that led to is at some point they're reviewing the case, all the information that they've collected about the case. They come across this statement from an officer from this, this, uh, and I have his name here. Uh, I can't find it at the moment, but bear with me, captain. They find the statement and they go, Oh, we need to talk to this guy. So this is much more official. October 13th, 2022, they ask Richard Allen to come in. They ask his wife to come in. It's not described this way, but I'm assuming that they spoke to them separately. They may have spoke to them together and separately. We don't know how that went down. But what we do know is that his wife confirms for law enforcement that, yes, my husband does have guns and knives in our home. And Richard Allen confirms for them in October of 2022 Yes, I was on the trails that day. And so what we then have is a rush job because you got to have a rush job. And I'll tell you why here in a minute, you go off to the judge and you go, look, here's, we, we just typed all this up. We need you to grant a, a search warrant for this home and property. And we need, we want to issue this search warrant immediately. So the way that this goes down And you can picture it, right? They're talking to these two individuals at the department. At some point during those conversations, they go, you know what? Somebody who, uh, who can we get? We need someone to start typing up that affidavit immediately. We need to get papers in front of a judge for them to sign off on a search warrant. And we need to do this today. So from my understanding, it was roughly around 5 PM that day. They get the search warrant. They drive them right out to the home, right out to the property. And now they are carrying out that search warrant. And the search warrant specifically says that Richard Allen and his wife have to leave the property. They have to leave the residence during the course of this search. Right. What happens is at some point they decide this guy has taken priority over everyone else. And now they've decided he, we might have shown our hand. We might have tipped our cap and and, and shown our hand here. And now he knows he's not a witness. We are not interviewing him as a witness anymore. He's a suspect. We cannot let this guy go home and have access to all this stuff that we're, we believe we may find at his property. Because now he may destroy the evidence, discard the evidence, hide the evidence. We need to get there as soon as we can. ASAP. A-S-A-M-P. So they, they, I bet you they drag out the, the conversation with him and the wife for a, a period of time while they could type up this document. Go and get permission from the judge. This is when you go... Judge, I, I can't, don't have time for an appointment. Here's why I need you to sign this right now if you agree with the information that we've put in this document. So that we can be there on his doorstep when they get home before he has time to destroy any evidence. Right. And we can we can carry out the search warrant. And you can picture this, right? Yeah, can you please stop asking me if I can picture something? This is not that hard to picture. It's not an abstract painting there, Gene. Richard Allen and his wife probably standing on the front lawn not allowed to go into their home watching these men and women of law enforcement removing boxes and bags of evidence or potential evidence from their home. Can you picture it? (laughs) And then after the tests are run on this six hour gun, that is when he is arrested. So he, (laughs) he must've been sweating bullets and shitting himself for, for the period of time between the 13th and the 28th when they arrested him. Yeah, so again, like you were saying, they're interviewed on the 13th. They do the search on the 13th. The ballistic um, results come back on the 19th. And then there's a a time period. And I don't know what the time period. You'd think once once that test comes back, the ballistic test comes back, they would make arrest right away. But for some reason, there was a delay, and, and Richard Allen was arrested on the 26th. Yeah, and then what we do have here is a document, and this is stating 
how some of this went down and why it went down the way that it did. As the captain points out, arrested on the 26th, charges were brought on the 28th, and this were for two counts of of murder. And he's taken into custody, moved to the Westville Correctional Facility. This is for safekeeping, as stated in the documents. And this, they say, is because when he was taken into custody, he was placed on suicide watch because of certain statements that Richard Allen made about harming himself. Now, they go on to talk about some of his day-to-day at this facility in this document, stating that throughout his stay, his mental health improved to a point that he was taken off of suicide watch. He was also participating in recreation time and beginning to exercise. The facility reports that Richard Allen was doing well and that they had no issues or concerns. His day-to-day demeanor was that he was quiet, read a lot of books, did crossword puzzles, and exercised daily. On April 3rd, 2023, Richard Allen made a phone call to his wife. In that phone call, Richard admits several times that he killed Abby and Libby. Investigators had the phone call transcribed, and the transcription confirms that Richard Allen admits that he committed the murders of Abby and and Libby. He admits several times within the phone call that he committed the offenses as charged. Right. His wife ends the phone call abruptly at some point. So it sounds to me like he, he, he's saying it in an almost cryptic, unclear way to his wife. Uh, I committed the offenses I'm charged with. And at some point may have been much more clear about what it is that he did in that phone call. And then she hangs up on him. Yeah. And from my knowledge, I don't think she's been back to see him since. Um, I had some local people that told me that she was at the hearings. um, And before this confession, supposedly they were making some eye contact and try to communicate at the, at those hearings. But ever since his confession, uh, it's almost like she's not being responsive to him at, at the, the trial now at the hearings now after this confession. And we also know that she has sold the property. So I, you know, I don't know. It's that's one of those items where it's like, you could read a lot into it. Um, where you go, well, she she knows he's going to be found guilty, so she knows he's not going to come home. Maybe she can't afford that place by herself. But well, we we can we actually have information in these documents that might make that whole situation a little more clearer mm-hmm. uh, when we get to when we get to those. We're trying to go through these in in the order that they were released. Primarily for the reason that it was very, it would be very difficult for us to create a new order of of these documents with them amounting to 283 pages. Mm-hmm. But in this document, the they're talking about then after this phone call, where his, his mental health and his demeanor was getting better leading up to this point, and 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 they say since he arrived at this facility. Then they say after the phone call that Richard Allen's mental state has declined since then. And this goes along with what the defense is stating, that he should be moved to another facility. But I believe that this is the the facility and the state's reasoning that it's not the facility that's at fault for his decline. It's the individual who might be responsible for his decline. Now, keep in mind, his defense team has said in the court of law that they will challenge the the accuracy and the credibility of his statements, that maybe he's just lost it and he's admitting to something that he did not do. Right. That's, that's what, what they are saying. Now, What they do agree with is with what the state says that here's the statements, both sides reviewed them and the defense agreed. Yes, those are incriminating statements. Well, and that's the thing though, is, you know, it's years of an investigation. Then you get 
you finally make an arrest, the guy starts saying right away, I'm innocent, I'm innocent. But as the defense is handed more and more evidence against you, and obviously he's privy to that information, it's not crazy to think that he's going to snap and eventually tell his wife, you know, the truth because he wants to protect her. He wants to have her hear it from him first. And then, you know, we talk about whether his wife is visiting him or not calling him, but keep in mind, he, we don't know the setup. He may have to be the one to initiate a call. He may not be able to receive them. We do know that he can have phone calls and conduct phone calls on this tablet that he's been given. He can, in fact, text message with this tablet and he can, do phone calls, but we do know that he broke the tablet at some point. And as of, they're saying that, that, that leading up to April 3rd, Richard Allen was making about two phone calls a day. And then afterward, at some point he breaks the tablet. He's not making any phone calls at all. You know, you look at this information and you go, okay, well maybe it's not just as as simple as she's cut off communication to him. Mm -hmm. He may have broke his communication device. And on top of that has decided not to have any more phone calls. And then they go on to say that he, at some point began wetting down documents that, that were from his defense team and eating them, consuming them. He's a fucking moron. And it's and he also has refused to sleep. Good, don't. Sleep. He was refusing to eat and refusing to sleep. He would go days on end refusing to sleep. <sighs> he further broke the tablet that he used for text messages and phone calls, and then it states that he went from two phone calls a day to zero to none at all. Yeah, when a prisoner goes without eating, it it becomes a hun- hunger strike, and so sometimes depending on how long that hunger strike is, they'll go back and forth on suicide watch. Well, if he had demands, a hunger strike's only a hunger strike if you're, you know, refusing to eat's only a hunger strike if you have demands. No, but what I'm saying is if they offer him food and he just says he doesn't want to eat it, that they can put him on, they can put him in a a more restrictive, confined space. Correct, because that's proof that he may be, he may be up for harming himself. Right. We all know we need to eat to survive. So the the direct, the exact statement here is Richard Allen was wetting down paperwork he had gotten from his attorneys and eating it. He was refusing to eat and refusing to sleep. Now, at some point that changes and he starts eating and sleeping again. Here's the thing. This all sounds very crazy, right? I don't, I'm not, I don't think it sounds crazy. I'm not a healthcare professional. I do not know. I'm not an expert, don't know anything about this type of behavior at all. And in fact, we're only reading it as words on, on paper. We've not witnessed any of this. We've not talked to this man, but I have my suspicions. Sounds like he's put on a big show. As the investigators told us during the course of this investigation, that for the perpetrator, this was always about power and this was always about control. And whoever did this had the power over this entire community of this secret, something that they only knew the answer to that nobody else knew. So that's one form of the power that this individual would have held over others. Also the power that they may have experienced on that day while committing the crimes or in, in other ways since then the control part, to me is, yeah, of course they controlled the victims and and things of that nature. And sometimes we've even seen cases where the perpetrator wants to try to control the, the investigation or the narrative of the crimes. But for me, I've always thought about this. And to me, I think this is, is somewhat confirmation of this is that Richard Allen may be of the type that, that he needed control because he had no control. Now, not necessarily, we're not talking about a puppet master situation. We're talking about everybody. It's a natural desire for all of us to feel that we are in control of our own lives. 
and that we do have some control of the things around us and the events going on in our lives. Not me, because uh, Carrie Underwood taught me a great lesson. Jesus, take the wheel. Well, I wish that I wish that that would have been the same experience for whoever whoever committed these crimes, and in this case, Richard Allen. Because what I think is part of this behavior that we're we're being told of here is that he wants to have or feel, or at least feel like he has some control or control of his own life. Maybe he's never felt 100% that way. Maybe that's a huge inadequacy for him. And now he's lost even more control. If there was communication back and forth between him and his wife, and she ended that, well, his world just got more disrupted. And what he can control the he's in a confined space with very few privileges and almost no control over his life at this point. But one of the very few things that he can control is the stuff that sits in the cell with him. And this may just be a way of him trying to destroy that or trying to find some type of control in that confined space. If you're looking for an easy way to ensure your children reach their full potential, IXL is the perfect learning program for you. IXL is the most comprehensive online learning program for K through 12, covering math, language arts, science, and social studies. On IXL, you'll find interactive practice problems, videos, lessons, and games organized by grade and subject. As your child uses the program, they'll get detailed explanations of new concepts, awards to celebrate hard work, and recommendations of topics to practice to close knowledge gaps or build on what they are learning. Memberships start at $9.95 a month, so it's much more affordable than a private tutor. And as a parent, you'll get meaningful reports on your child's progress. Studies nationwide have shown that students who use IXL are scoring higher on tests. I've had several family members use, enjoy, and excel with the IXL learning experience. Some were trying to get ahead, some were trying to keep up with the class, and others were continuing their education and learning during the summer break. Plus, you'll save time and money over that of a traditional tutor. For a limited time, True Crime Garage listeners can get 20% off IXL membership. Visit IXL.com slash garage today. All right, you filthy animals. Cheers to you. Thanks for joining us here in the garage. Thank you, one and all. So here we go, Captain. This... This is where we like to give a little thanks and praise to the listeners, right? With a quick shout out, a quick cheers. Maybe we cheers one another, but I think we uh, cheers is due to a, a person that we've become friendly with over the past year or so. And someone that I know that uh, you've had the privilege of meeting in person, at least on one occasion, but in part, these documents become unsealed and released to the public through request to the judge that we have some more transparency in this case for the media that is trying to cover it. And one of those persons that is responsible for getting this information out into the masses is Kevin from the murder sheet. And he, he filed limited appearance by an attorney. He's an attorney yeah. And this was his request for these documents to be unsealed. And I mean, the murder sheet has done great work on this case throughout the years and they've used his, his power as an attorney to get some documents released over the course of the year. So just, a, just, a, I mean, he's, he's a great guy. First of all, I was lucky enough to talk to him 
just days before these documents came out. Such a such a cool and humble guy that he didn't tell me that he he was making a push for these documents to be released. He just said there might be some documents coming out. So a uh, big shout out to him and uh, Anya and and their both of them for for all of their work. Yes, on this and I, I look forward next time we get to sit down and eat some nachos and tacos. Mm. But Kevin uh, maybe is the world's fastest eater of all time. So. Maybe you should do one of those uh, contests, the hot dog contest. Well, I just ESPN. tell people, you know, if you're going to eat dinner with him, just don't leave your hands up on the table. <laughs> he might uh, Luke Skywalker you. So this is one thing that we kind of teased earlier, and this is a letter, the handwritten letter from Richard Allen to the the Carroll County Circuit Court. And this was filed in November, early November of 2022. I don't know when this letter was scripted or, or sent, but uh, I'll, I'll read it to you because it's nice and short. But it, it also reveals some other things that we've discussed previously. And it states, and then again, this is from Richard Allen. It says, in the cause listed above, I, Richard Allen, hereby throw myself at the mercy of the court. I am begging to be provided with legal assistance in a public defender or whatever help is available. At my initial hearing on October 28th, 2022, I asked to find representation for myself. However, at the time, I had no clue how expensive it would be just to talk to someone. I also did not realize what my wife and I's immediate financial situation was going to be. We have both been forced to immediately abandon employment, myself due to incarceration and my wife for her personal safety. She has had to abandon our house for her own safety. What little reserve there is will fail to even maintain the original residence. That word's cut off, but I'm assuming that's what he's. Yeah, and just to cut you off there, this is what I was saying on the last episode is there's a lot of speculation because she sold the property on what that means and what's going to happen in this trial. And I would go back to this exactly. le- letter and say, look, well, one, her safety, she needs to get out of there. And two, if they can't afford it, put it up on the market, get it sold. That's done. Now they don't have to worry about that. That doesn't mean he's going to plead guilty and, 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 and that she's preparing for him to plead guilty. Right. The sale of the house, for all we know, could have been in the cards two, three, four months ago. It appears nobody was living there for their own safety. Richard Allen, of course, isn't living there because he's in the, in a cell. And without any money coming in from employment, they may have been forced to do this. Right. It may not have been of their choosing. So I think one thing that's important to, we say this with all the cases, not just the Delphi case, before you start your speculation and then passing it off, especially when in this case, a lot of times the speculation or rumor gets passed off at fa- as fact at some point, review all of the information before you come up with an opinion on it. Now, uh, this here, Captain, and I hope you will allow me to to read this in its entirety. No. I will skip over some of the names because, again, I don't think that they're all necessary for what's going on here. But this is our this is our inmate that's that's going to be very vocal about what his opinion is or could be just lies, could be the truth of the situation at this Westville Corrections facility. And this is addressed to the clerk of courts. And this was a letter that was sent April. It appears to be 11th of 2023. And the letter states, I am an inmate at the Westville correction facility in the same unit that Richard Allen is being housed in awaiting trial. Richard Allen is being abused and mistreated along with other inmates in Westville control unit, restrictive housing. There are corrupt officers and ranking officers calling Richard Allen a kid killer, teasing him that he has a visit from his his family. Phone is ringing on his tablet. Inmates in the cell threatening to kill Richard Allen and telling him to kill himself. These inmates have made these comments in front of 
the warden, in front of ranking officers and officers. The staff has recorded on camera these inmates making these threats and suggestions to kill himself and has done nothing to stop it. So let me kind of unpack a little bit of this. Yeah, but what are you going to go through and put a muzzle on everybody? Well, exactly. You yeah. can't you you can tell the guys to shut up. Hey, hey stop talking to him, stop threatening him, whatever. But I mean, really Again, I don't, this does not, I'm not saying, I'm not applauding this type of behavior if it is happening. For all we know, this this person that wrote this letter could be making all of this up or all of it could be happening. But I'm not applauding this type of behavior. I'm just pointing out that this does not seem to be anything out of the norm given the charges that this man is facing. And so what it sounds like here, Captain, that this individual is stating is that the he believes or stating that the guards would tease him, tease Richard Allen, like, hey, guess what? You got a visit from your family. And then they just leave him sitting there and sitting there. There is no visit. Right. It, it's fake. Um, or or phoning his tablet, maybe. Him thinking that he's getting a call from a loved one or someone that, that is on his side. And then maybe they're hanging up. Uh, and it's it's no... No call at all. It's just them ringing his tablet. I Page two says, I have proof and evidence of assaults by ranking officers and officers on inmates, abuse and mistreatment in grievance. And the, I'm, I apologize. Some of the handwriting I cannot read here. Uh, but going on to say that things have been mishandled and covered up because the Indiana Department of Corrections is allowed to police itself with their Office of Investigations and Intelligence. I recently sent letters to the U.S. Department of Justice, and they go on to state that they have sent information to the DOJ and the FBI about this corruption and abuse that's going on in the Indiana Department of Corrections, and go on to state that they sent information to the New York Times as well, and the University School of Law. So th this person is kind of raising the alarm here, saying these the way that the inmates are being treated here is is not up to par. It's not up to standard. In fact, it's it's not just that. These are assaults, abuse, and mistreatment of the persons being housed here. Yeah, and this prisoner has a reputation for being a, what they call a prison lawyer and and making these claims and, and basically anytime he has a complaint, making sure that it's noted and, and is going to the right channels. That doesn't mean that this stuff is not happening, but he's just known. That's his... Um, That's his M.O. Yeah. That's how he passes the time. But what we, again... We're not there. We don't know if this is a lie, a fabrication, or it is happening, or somewhere between in between. But what we do know is this. This inmate wrote this letter, addressed it to the clerk of courts, and we know because they stamped it and filed it that it was received by the clerk of courts. So where he's pointing out that the the, the Department of Corrections in Indiana has the they police themselves. What we do know is they allowed this document to make it to where this inmate intended to send it. They, if if they wanted to be completely corrupt and cover and completely involved in a cover up, they could have very easily just taken this letter and pulled a Richard Allen and wet it down and ate it, and it would never have gotten to the clerk of courts. But we know that it made it there. Yeah, or wet it down and shove it up your ass. Onward and upward. The next. Line item is the charging documents. Yes, there are two of these, and they're they're identical, nearly identical. Twins. Of Twinsies. course, there there should be two of them because they it's a two counts of murder. Right. We unfortunately we have two victims here, and so it's a document for each count. And what it's a very short description saying that what Alan is charged with is as simple as this. On or about February 13th, 2017, 
in the county of Carroll, the state of Indiana, Richard M. Allen did kill another human being. Victim one while committing or attempting to commit kidnapping of victim one. Document number two states the exact same thing. Just replace victim number one with victim number two. So he's being charged with killing a human being while committing or attempting to commit kidnapping of those victims. The thing that jumped off the page to me that I thought was very intriguing is it lists the witnesses. Now, these are not people that witnessed the kidnapping or attempted kidnapping. They're not people that witnessed what he is being charged with. This is part of the discovery, right? This is part of the information that will be provided to the defense. This is a list of witnesses that they, that when this document was filed of witnesses, they intend to call to testify at trial. And the reason why I found this to be so intriguing, uh, a couple of things. One, three of these witnesses are described only as a, an abbreviation of their names. And this makes a lot of sense because that would line up with the names that were previously redacted in other documents. The other thing here though, too, is there's been a lot, the thing that's upset me and really pissed me off with this case is all of the bad rumors that come in out of Delphi, or maybe they originated elsewhere, but they just seem to swirl around and swirl around and swirl around. And to the, to the point where some people then interpret them as fact, the one, one of the, the rumors has been, and, and this may come about who knows, but what I can state is from this document, it does not appear to be the case. The rumor has been that, that Richard Allen's daughter will be testifying in court and, and maybe te be testifying for the state that, it, that she is a part of the state's case. Her name is not on this document. Yeah, rightfully so. Right. Well, it, they, according to this document, they have no intention of calling her to the stand. Right. Well, it's such a small community. I think that if these eyewitnesses and their identity get, gets out, that they're going to get pressure from the community or they're going to get pressure from the, the defense. Well, their names are out there now. Um, they're, so, again, these are not necessarily eyewitnesses to the crime or anything of that nature. These are just people that the state intends to call to the stand. Now, these... Again, these names could, we, we could add names to this later. That's their right. They could also remove the names. But as the filing of this document, there are 23 people that are listed as people that they intend to call to the stand. And the other thing too, we, we, we got to be perfectly clear. Just because the state intends to call somebody to the stand does not mean that they are a witness for the state's case. It's just simply that they have knowledge that the state wants to be presented at trial. Right. Right. So they are the reason why this rumor comes about with the daughter again, could be true. I've not seen anything that makes it a hardcore fact, but one degree of separation is Richard Allen's wife is listed on this document. Again, everybody, the public needs to understand that does not mean that Richard Allen's wife intends to get on the stand and build the state's case against her husband. Likely, and we see this all the time in murder trials, she's being called by the state to back up and to verify all of the information where she is listed in court documents. The search warrant, the affidavit for the search warrant, because she, her statements to police, are part of the reasons why they were seeking that search warrant to begin with. Mrs. Allen, in October of 2022, you were interviewed by the sheriffs at the sheriff's department. Is that correct? Yes. During the course of that interview, did you agree with the statement from the sheriff's department that your husband had guns and knives in his home, in your home? Yes. Yes. That's likely the most, 
the most likely reason why she's being called. Now, would you try to pepper her with some other questions that could really throw this dude under the bus? Well, yeah, of because course. you could ask her about the confession. So Exactly. And you, and you have a transcript of that, which will be, you said how many documents were, were, it was decided would not be included in this release? I think it was 18 or 19. And you know what? I, Captain, I wonder if those transcripts are part of that because they state yeah. in these documents that they have a transcription of that phone call and other phone calls. Yeah, that's definitely something I think they're going to have to wait to sift through at trial. I mean, this is, you know, we we started covering this case from the beginning. You have, yep. when you're investigating any of these cases, you, you start coming out with questions on, on your own. And it seems like the, these 283 documents are starting to... 283 pages. It's, 200, yeah, two, 283 pages but 283 pages of information, it's painting a picture of what happened. And, you know, one of the things that I thought was strange, um, this was pointed out to me by our bud, buddy Fig Solves, is one of the things they say is, from Richard M. Allen's statements, investigators believe that Richard M. Allen was also on his phone when he was on the uh, when he was on the trail prior to meeting the girls now this could be a nothing burger because this might just be what they're they're calling it he, but he's, meeting is kind of a weird term don't you think because that it's almost implying that there was a a meeting set up for them to meet yeah that that's a real interesting way of wording it now we do know from previous documentation that he has told law enforcement that he was on his phone, but not on a phone call. He was checking stocks, checking right. the stock ticker. But you know what I mean? Like that's, that's something that's fascinating and it could just be that they used the wrong terminology, but I think they would have to be pretty careful when they're releasing this stuff to the public. But he says meeting the girls. Yeah. Uh, you, again, you, nothing, nothing in the documents so far that, proves that there was we don't think prior there were communication yes we don't think that there was a meeting or prior communication but very interesting the wording of that captain because i think you and i would agree our definition of meeting would imply that it was previously arranged by both parties right that they would they would meet at the same location at the same time now one thing i'm having a hard time with and this is more of just a plea to the masses to to help me keep my some keep a grasp on my own sanity too late well it, par, part too late. of it you're not so yeah it's a, for this guy it is certainly a short drive to crazy town mm. but there's a couple of our listeners that i love but you know what you're you're not helping me keep a, a firm grasp on that sanity it is july right is that what they tell us? It's July of 2023. Richard Allen was arrested last year. This thing is marching its way toward a, a double homicide trial. And I am still receiving emails that tell me that the mayor killed Libby and Abby. Uh, I addressed it in the book, in my book, the Delphi murders. And p please just, I love my favorite part of doing this show. One of my favorite parts. I love the research. I love working with the captain. But one of my other favorite parts is engaging with the listeners and having a good back and forth. That's why Crime Con so much fun. Book signings fun. Our event at BrewDog that we've done two years in a row, a blast for me because I, get, I, I love the questions. I love people telling me their theories. I love people telling me what we do right and do wrong on the show. I love all that. That ship is sailed. We, I don't, I do not need another email telling me that the mayor was responsible. What we are talking about today is Richard Allen and talking about the charges against him. In fact, I, I, I deleted this from my notes for today, captain. Uh, cause I told myself on my drive here to the garage, I wasn't going to bring this up, but here I am liar, foot, foot and mouth, liar, liar, pants on fire. 
foot and mouth, and I'm talking about it anyway, but I believe is his name Shane Evans? The yes. uh, okay, and and I don't know if he's the current mayor. At some point, I kept I lost I, I I stopped keeping track of Shane Evans. He's not a good suspect. Uh, yeah. At the one press conference when they zoom in on his face, he does look like he's about to get sick. I can agree with that statement. He looks very uncomfortable at that press conference. Watch the other faces; they look rather uncomfortable as well. Shane Evans is a young dude, and you know what? I've found myself in this situation more than once. I'm not saying that Shane Evans did this. I found myself in the situation where maybe I went out the night before a long day of work and, and didn't realize how long of a day it's going to be or how, how serious the day was going to be. And I stayed out a little too late, had a too few mini soda pops and found myself in a situation where I'm a little dehydrated, tired, hungover. Um, I've probably had that face that he had in several meetings that I've been in, especially in my twenties and thirties. Now, I believe he might be working with the prosecutor. I don't know if he became the st- the city attorney or what, but I've seen his name in an attorney capacity on some of these documents. As said, though, I I, I have deleted them from my notes here for today. Yeah, but there's this is how it always works. I mean, whatever evidence comes out, some people. Some people need to double down and just be right. When this investigation first started, look, they show you a picture, guy on the bridge. Then they're interviewing the guy the guy that owns the property that the victims are found on, and he's dressed just like the guy on the bridge. And so a lot of people jump to the conclusion, well, this guy's lying to law enforcement. They're found on his property. He looks... Uh, and is dressed like bridge guy, Ron Logan must have killed these girls. And no matter what information or what evidence comes out, they're going to stick to their guns on their initial belief. But that's not trying to get to the truth. And I don't know. And I think it's very disrespectful to the victims. Abby and Libby deserve for all of us to look at the evidence that is coming out and try to find uh, justice and peace for them and their family. Yeah. The, the well said there, captain. And the, the last document that I had for review is the certificate of analysis. We talked about this a little bit earlier, the state's case against Richard Allen. The biggest part of that case is this unspent shell that was found at the murder scene. And their statement of through our search and seizure of his home, we found a gun, we found identical uh, ammunition, and we tested those and came to the conclusion that the the marks on the the live round at the found at the scene came from his gun. So just to put this more in in. Uh, terms that 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 will be in the courts and the way that the court sees it is this comes from the indianapolis regional laboratory in indianapolis indiana and the as you pointed out earlier captain that these tests were conducted and then there was some time that expired before the arrest of richard allen and then charging him two days later so as you pointed out he's arrested on the 26th I pointed out charged on the 28th. This certificate of analysis is dated October 19th. Uh, They performed these tests from the 14th to the 19th, according to this document. And the tests were on a cartridge in item 016, identified as having been cycled in the firearm in item 314. So those are numbers of the inventory of the items seized from his home item 314 would be the, the handgun, the six hour handgun and the remarks, the statements by the person conducting the analysis says, or conducting the test, their remarks are an identification opinion is reached when the evidence exhibits an agreement of class 
characteristics, and a sufficient agreement of individual marks. Sufficient agreement is related to the significant duplication of random impressed marks as evidenced by the correspondence of a pattern or combination of patterns of surface contours. The interpretation of identification is subjective in nature. Again, that means opinion needed subjective in nature and based on relevant scientific research and the reporting examiner's training and experience. So they're stating here method methodology used to reach results, opinions, and interpretations, microscopic comparisons. So that is what the case is going to be built around as far as physical evidence goes. And then we have these potential eyewitness statements. And then the 23 people that we know that at one point, at least the state intends to call to the stand to back up information that they have found in their investigation, which led them to the doorstep of Richard Allen. I want to thank everybody for joining us here in the garage. A little bit of a different episode, but but fascinating to look into these documents and to see what weight this is going to have on the upcoming trial. Colonel, do we have any recommended reading for the beautiful listeners? Yes, we do, beautiful listeners. This week we are recommending Coal Country Killing, a culture, a union, and the murders that changed it all by... Robert Tenenbaum and the great Steve Jackson. If you are a Apple subscriber to true crime garage off the record, you may have already heard an interview that we had with Steve Jackson. He's a great true crime author. He's authored many great true crime books over the years. And this is just the latest in that long line of great works from Steve Jackson. This is, is the most complete telling of a murder case and story that I had never heard of. And it also features the true story of these fumbling and bumbling criminals that were known as the hillbilly hitman. So check out Steve Jackson's latest work, coal country killing a culture, a union and the murders that changed it all. You can find that great title and many other recommendations on our recommended page on our website, truecrimegarage.com. And until next week, be good, be kind, and don't litter.